Up next is Adam Pumphrey. Adam is a consultant for Nimbus. Please welcome Adam to the stage. All right, is this thing, everybody got audio? Good, all right. Well, welcome to my talk, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm gonna talk about how to baseline the network with Zeek. Um, as, as Amber just mentioned, my name is Adam Humphrey, um, cybersecurity guy, been in the business for about 19 years now, most of which was spent as a, a federal contractor working in the public sector. Oh, yeah. Swap. There we go. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Zeke for about 10 years. Uh, initially, that was, it was kind of in the form of a, a network you know, data source, a, a visibility into network communications, um, primarily for the use of threat detection, incident response, and, and forensics. Um, but here of late, it's, it's been, I've kind of shifted my focus more to, to getting an understanding of the scripting language and and trying to use it to, to solve problems, uh, network, network monitoring problems. We've got lots of experience with, with Zeek in a wide variety of different environments and, and solving different use cases. And it's kind of become one of the things I like to do is just, just look for novel ways to use it to, to solve those challenges. So what I'm here to talk about today is kind of an idea that I've been kicking around for a long time now. Um, implemented in a, in a variety of different ways over the years. Um, it's not anything novel, uh, I don't think, um, but it, maybe the, the approach and, and the way I've, I've, I've tried to make it happen in Zeek is, is some, somewhat different. Um, and that is this notion of, of baselining the network, forming a, a kind of a foundational understanding of, of what normal network communications look like so you can then compare new observations to that baseline and, and look for deviations. Uh, so I'm going to take you through things today. I'm going to kind of frame the, the problem that I'm, I'm trying to solve with this approach. Um, then I'm going to describe a little bit uh, quickly about uh, what I think baselines are, at least in this context. And you, you hear that, that term used frequently in a lot of different ways. And then I'm going to talk about a Zeek module that, that I've been working on. And I will tell you up front, this is very much a a module, a, a work in progress, right? It's uh, something that I've started working on a couple of months ago, um, not yet released, and that's, you'll see later in, in the deck that uh, uh, that's one of the things that I, I really want to make happen in the next week or so. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how I kind of use this technique to instrument some traffic analysis methodologies. Um, simple stuff, things that you can do in SIMS, um, log, log collection analysis engines, um, don't necessarily need Zeek to do it, but I thought it was a perfect fit for the use case. And then I'll talk about how to use baselines and, um, as they're defined here, and then just wrap it up with some other considerations and things, uh, things to think about. So um, you see I have uh, the problem um, with the strike through there. It's not th the only problem, of course, as that we face as network defenders. Um, it's just one of many. And that is, uh, network defenders really need to gain an understanding of what normal kind of looks like in their environment in order to, to be able to identify when they're analyzing data, you know, network traffic data, what abnormal looks like. You know, that, 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 that foundational understanding is kind of critical to, to being a successful network defender. There's a lot of, a lot of things that network defenders need to, to be aware of in addition to what normal, or to make understanding normal kind of possible. And that's you know what hosts, what devices exist in the environment, what operating systems they run, client applications, services, other hosts and other services they interact with internally and, and even externally. And that's a lot to, to wrap your head around. And once you get that understanding, you know this this you have this temporal con context, right? This this what looks normal today is it normal compared to what happened with this this device ten minutes ago? yesterday, last week, and so on. So there's, there's again, there's this whole other dimension to, to understanding what normal looks like. And with all that, there's a lot of data available, in particular, you know, data in the form of, of log streams that Zeke produces. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous asset that way. It, it's so much visibility. Sometimes it can be overbearing for folks that, that are new to the tool and new to the, to, to the output. 
And it's a lot to get your arms around. So where do you kind of begin? The, uh, a little bit more about the data, too. You know, of forming baselines is, is kind of by its, by its nature, kind of requires quantitative data. And most of the, the network protocol metadata that we see in Zeek logs is, is qualitative. It's, they're descriptors. These are attributes pulled out of header fields, uh, protocol header fields. And some examples there are IP addresses, user agents, URLs, domains. Um, tons of great value and, and can be very telling, great for IOC matching and, and things like that, um, but hard to kind of analyze in mass. There's other numerical data points available in the log streams. You get your byte and packet counters. Um, these, are, these are great measures and, and very useful for this sort of thing. And then there's a few other examples, duration, interval, and rate. Uh, duration is gonna be, you know, you're gonna find that in, your, in, the, in the native con log stream. Um, interval and rate need to be calculated, but it's, it's totally possible uh, with a little bit of Zeek scripting. So even though there are some, some very useful numerical measures, quantitative measures, they kind of lack context, in my opinion, you know, unless you can, you can take in the, the whole picture. So in that whole picture, again, is, is kind of what I'm referring to as a network baseline and, and for these purposes. So I want to run through uh, some explanation of what I think uh, baselines are for this context. Um, and, and we'll just take a look, a quick look at a couple of example baselines. Those are baselines. Those are end lines on a tennis court. Obviously not relevant for this conversation. Uh, just, I kid, I jest. Um, also, baselines, the lines that connect home plate to first, second, and third on a baseball diamond. Are there any Nats fans in here? Washington Nationals fans? Yeah. All right, there we go. They pulled off some amazing stuff last night. I don't know if you're familiar. So anyway, I, I kid. Um, this, these are not the baselines that I talk about here. Uh, what I'm really talking about is this definition that you can, you can find simply just by Googling baselines. Um, and it's, it's one of a couple that, that'll come pop right up. And that is a minimum or starting point used for comparisons. And I think that that definition of baselines is the, the perfect fit for this, this application. So all that said, how do you go about creating and using a baseline? And I've talked, you know, been, been at this for a long time. Most of my time uh, professionally has been spent doing network traffic analysis in one way or another. And talking to colleagues and, and other folks at conferences like this, you know, I often say you need, you need to baseline your network. You need to form a, a foundational baseline, a foundational understanding of what's normal. And, you know, it wasn't too long after I realized that I'd never really made any suggestions on how to accomplish doing that. And, and in fact, I haven't really heard any, you know, any other folks uh, offer any. Um, Baselining, network baselining is a term that's used in, in information technology, and, and in particular in network engineering circles. Um, you know, folks that, that operate network infrastructure uh, will baseline a network to, to get an idea for the capacity and load, um, speed, um, and, and packet loss, and, and, and any loss that's induced by that, uh, that load. But for this context, I think uh, it actually has some real application to the work of cybersecurity, and um, in particular for, for us network defenders that have to, to kind of form an understanding of what's normal. Uh, so my, my kind of theory on how you can go about creating a baseline is starts out with making quantitative observations um, that describe network host behavior, host interactions, protocol usage, things like that. You need to record those observations in a standard format. Thankfully, Zeke makes that they're very easy and straightforward. And then once you have that, that log stream, you just need to analyze the data. You look for patterns. Um, you can analyze the data manually, visually, and even statistically. But you want to look for patterns and then, and then try to spot deviations. And, and that can help you form an understanding of what normal looks like and, again, how to spot abnormal. Now for the big reveal, right? NetBase. 
Uh, the gentleman from MITRE yesterday talked about how all projects need to have a cool name. And, you know, I find that as, you know, as difficult as writing a bio, for example. Like, that's, it's, uh, coming up with a cool name for a project is, is tough. Um, but as you can probably figure out here, uh, NetBase is just a concatenation of network baseline. So what NetBase is to me at a high level is, um, is, is just a, a Zeek module, of course, um, that's really centered around monitoring IP addresses and, and uh, collecting and recording observations about what I define as monitored IP addresses. And those, those observations are, it can be about attrib host attributes and behaviors, activities, you know, again, protocols and, and system interactions. And in the context of this, this module, I refer to those as observables. And they're just little bits of information that describe host behavior. And you might see that uh, I've got monitored in, in italics there, and that's because you know, there's a lot of different ways to describe monitored. Um, for the context of my testing and, and my work on the project here, monitored is pretty much limited to um, the, the IP addresses that fall into the subnets that are defined in the, the site local nets variable. Um, but there are other ways to, to break that down, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Uh, essentially, what NetBase is doing is making these observations for monitored IP addresses, uh, cruise those over time uh, for a set, set amount of time. In this case, I've, I've chosen five minutes to be kind of an arbitrary time bucket that uh, I collect observations for. And then at the end of that interval, we write, write the observation summary out to the log stream. And, and that's when you know, the real work, the, the analytics work, is, is, needs to be done. So um, to describe the, the structure of uh, the module at a, at a very high level, um, you have the Zeek workers uh, down there at the bottom. They're doing the hard work of traffic inspection, protocol analysis. They're taking you know, uh, application layer protocols and turning those into a higher order events and then you know, they're executing event handlers um, based on, on the events that are risen up. They're also using this model, uh, creating what, it, what I re refer to as observables and using the data partitioning API that, that broker makes available, they're, they're sending those observables to the proxy pool. And you might notice that I've got two arrows from each worker pointing to each proxy and that's because the data partitioning API allows you to distribute the keys, with, in effect, or keys in a table across those proxies. And it's, it's a really good way for load balancing across uh, cluster members. So after the proxy has received these observables, they, they process the observable associated with an IP address in a table. And then at the end of that interval, they just log a summary. The, 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 the key in the table gets expired um, and, and remove from the, the table, and then the summary gets written to the log stream. Pretty straightforward. So now I want to talk about a couple of uh, core components, the key components of, of this module, um, and just to give, give you some, some frame of reference some, um, ar around what I'm talking about here. Uh, the observation record is kind of, it, it's kind of synonymous with the info record that you'll see in and many other Zeek frameworks and modules. Um, this is what determines what's get, what fields are included in the log stream. And you're probably looking at this and saying, well, that's only three fields. Um, that doesn't tell me a whole lot about a network baseline. And I totally agree with you. The, the way this is meant to work and the way many record types in Zeek are, are meant to work is that they're extendable. It has the redef attribute there. And it's, it's meant to be modular, so you can add additional fields that, that actually uh, correspond to what I was referring to as observables before. And you, you'll have some Zeek script that actually populates those fields and they get included in, in what's written out to the log stream. The next uh, core component I wanna talk about is the observations table. And this is the table that I mentioned that, that actually resides on proxy nodes in the cluster. Um, the structure is pretty simple. It's, it's not overly complicated. The, the key is 
the IP address for which these observations, to which these observations relate, and the yield value of that key is an observation record, you know, of the type that I was just describing. And you can see that uh, this is a, obviously a very truncated, mashed up example. It's kind of hard to show this on the slide. Um, but you have an address field, and, and yes, it's, it's kind of duplicative to what the, the key in the table is, but that's just to, to make it pretty simple to, to include in the log stream. Um, you have the start time, which as you can probably infer is the beginning of that, that time interval. And the end time, which as it sits in the table is, is uninitialized, and of course that, that's because not until the, the entry gets expired from the table do we, do we know what time the uh, interval ended, and that's when it gets populated. And then uh, in, in italics there, this a list of observables, another a wide variety of things that, uh, that have been tracked and, and monitored for each IP address. So uh, another thing to, to mention here, I, I talked about these, this arbitrary time bucket. And you know, I've chosen five minutes because in my testing, in my work, it seems, it seems to work pretty well. It's, it's, it's kind of res resource friendly as, as far as load on the cluster. And it's, it's a, a good time unit to use for comparisons, at least in my experience. Um, that's actually done just using the create expire attribute that's available on, on Z containers. And it works really well with keys in a table. Um, so that, you know, when I talk about creating arbitrary time buckets, it's underlying, that's, that's what's going on there, just using the create expire attribute. So um, now a little bit more about observables. Um, and this, this will be brief. The observable record is, is very simple. It's got two fields. It's got a name and a value. You might notice that the value field has the optional attribute, and that's because not all of these observables, not all of these observations um, require a value. Some, sometimes we're just keeping track. We're just counting the number of times things are being seen. Um, but the name field is important, and, and that actually corresponds to the, the field in the observation record that has been added. So anytime a worker makes an observation, creates this observable uh, record instance, and then sends that back to the proxy, the proxy looks at the name and, and associates it with a field in the observation record in the log stream. So that's how that's all married together. So like I mentioned, um, Workers are sending these observables, sending these little little bits of information back to proxies for processing and storage. Um, and it, I've included a convenience function to make this simple um, to do from within Zeek script. Um, there's other built-in scripts that, that use the data partitioning API, in particular the, the cluster publish underscore HRW or highest random weight uh, function to, to do this thing. Um, but I, I included this function just to kind of make it easy uh, and repeatable, and more to the point, I guess. Um, a couple of things to note. The, the first argument to this uh, published HR, HRW function is the, the node type that um, these, these events are gonna be published to. And then we have a series of arguments. The first one is the, or the second one, excuse me, is the IP address, um, which is the unique key that's gonna be distributed across the, the proxy nodes in the cluster. We have the name of the event that's gonna be executed when this, this publishing happens, and then the arguments to that event. And this is a, a custom event that's defined within the, the NetBase module. Um, the arguments are the IP address and the observation, which is a, a set, a unique list of those observable records that I was just describing. Uh, a couple of other components that are, are certainly notable, the log stream, uh, the, the core, the main log stream, and that's just net-based log stream, uh, net-based.log, and it, it includes the data points just like this, um, address, start and, start and end times, um, and then uh, this is kind of a, a really abbreviated example of, of the list of observables that I was talking about before. And we'll talk a little, talk through some examples of this in a few minutes here. I've also included a net-based stats log stream. Um, and this is really, you know, for management and, and monitoring of, of cluster health and 
Um, there's probably more to be had here, you know, more insight that you can gain. Um, but this, I thought, was a pretty good start. And this simply, these, these log events simply include the, the timestamp, of course, and the node ID um, that, that wrote this log entry, of course. Um, it'll be just a proxy identifier. And the number of keys, the number of IP addresses that it's, it's tracking these observations for. And then also the table size, the observations table size as it, as it sits in memory. And you can, of course, record this and, and plot this over time and get an idea for not only how the keys are being distributed across the proxies, but how that table grows and shrinks as, as entries are added and expire. So it's, it's helpful for get, keeping, uh, you know, staying aware of, of how resources are being impacted. So um, kind of the final component I want to mention is these protocol-specific modules. And this, is, again, is, is where I was talking about the observation record earlier on and, and, and describe how this is supposed to be modular. And it's kind of set up and structured like many, many other frameworks in Zeek are. You know, um, you're going to have con-specific, HTTP, DNS, SMTP, um, RPC, uh, SMB, very specific modules that all focus on analysis techniques that relate to those protocols. Um, so a little bit more about observables. There's a couple of types I'm working with right now. Um, and I think there's room to expand on this, but I thought this was a pretty good start. Um, one, the first type is the, it's essentially a counter of occurrences. The number of times um, a, a communication matched some logic, some condition, right? <laughs> And then the second is a distinct value count, the number of unique instances of a thing. Um, that might be IP addresses or ports, um, two examples of, of artifacts that I'm using and, and creating distinct counts of today. Um, but of course, that could be expanded on. And then there are other numerical measures, especially that apply to things like bytes and packet counters um, that, uh, that, I, that I hope to implement pretty soon. I think these, these are pretty straightforward and, and should be simple to get done. Um, just haven't done it yet, so working on that. So um, now I wanna just go through some examples of observables. And, and at a high level, I think these, if you kind of you know, take the tactics categories that, that are referenced in the attack model and kind of back, back off of those, kind of reverse engineer those almost, um, there are some analytical, you know, traffic analysis techniques, um, underlying traffic analysis techniques that pertain and, and can em enable you to, to identify those, those techniques. So a couple of examples, uh, internal port count, internal host count, the number of, of ports that, a, that an IP address communicated with in that time frame um, that, were, that were available and running on a, a other internal host. Uh, another number of unique internal host IP addresses communicated with. And alternatively, the number of external ports and external hosts. And you might be thinking, you know, the number of external hosts that a, a given IP address, especially if it's a, a workstation where, you know, the user's doing a lot of web browsing and such, that, that list could be long. And I totally agree. Um, I think it's a, it's a useful observation to make. Um, but it, you kind of, this is one of those situations where you kind of have to do a cost-benefit analysis and, and figure out, is it worth the resource load? A couple of other examples, the number of outbound uh, connections that were originated by this IP address, and out of those, the number of successful and rejected connections, um, things that are important to note, and it's important to distinguish, right? You know, when a box gets popped and tries to communicate out through the, the perimeter firewall on ports that aren't permitted, uh, this, this should start to rise to the top. And then you can get really specific, too. You could look for outbound connections on particular ports. Um, if you're worried about, you know, uh, use of particular protocols or just want to kind of baseline the usage of authorized protocols, these are, these are all possible using this, this approach. And then to kind of take that further, uh, there's, there's tons of tons of great information that you can kind of infer just from looking at connection logs. Um, and it, it goes on and on, you know, internal originated connections out of that connection count, how many were successful, how many were rejected. And I'll, I'll hopefully uh, illustrate, you know, how you might, might use some of these, these observations here in a few minutes. <clears throat> 
to run through a couple of other examples, um, and I, I mentioned it before, I would say it again, um, each of these are, are protocol specific. The, the, the analysis techniques that apply to these protocols are, are specific to that protocol, right? Um, so a couple of things that, that are important to note, uh, workstations or, or, or hosts acting as DNS servers. Of course, in most environments, there's a subset of hosts that perform this role, and you, ex you don't expect other systems to, to perform that role. And when you do, then you, you might have yourself a, a rogue DNS server situation, which I've seen a number of times, in fact. Um, so tracking the number of uh, times that a particular host acted as a DNS server or a DNS client, um, number of times from the server standpoint, the number of authoritative answers that it responded to queries with, or the number of recursive answers it responded to queries with. A couple of other things, a couple of other examples, external resource record count. You know, the number of distinct resource record types um, that were requested by a given IP address. And I find this is interesting because it's, it's actually a pretty effective way to detect DNS tunneling. Um, there's a number of the DNS tunneling tools out there that use kind of uncommon resource record types. You know, you expect to see the host records and pointer records and C names but when you start seeing a, a client request an MX record or a TXT record, things start to become weird. A couple other examples down there at the bottom. Um, for, from the server perspective, the number of NX domain responses that were sent. A client asked the, a DNS server for, uh, issued a query to a server to which it couldn't respond, it didn't have an answer. And then, then alternatively, you know, the number of NX domain responses a client received to DNS queries. Also uh, kind of useful in detecting botnet activity. The last uh, set of examples are HTTP specific. Um, very, very similar in, in practice here. The number of connections that uh, IP address acted as a server or as a client. Um, you get method specific. Um, this is you know, not an exhaustive list of, of possibilities here, just some examples. Um, break it down by post, sent, and received, you know, from the this perspective of a client versus a server. And then uh, you know, also error code responses, uh, whether the server responded with a 400 series error code or those were received by a client, and also an indicative of some abnormal activity going on. So I've run through a few examples of uh, observables, and, and, and again, as, as they're defined, for the purposes of, of this talk in this module. Um, so let's take it back to the baselines. So um, what I'm finding is that in practice, by creating a running record of, of these observations per IP address, you are in fact creating a baseline. And these are point in time observations that you can, you can use to compare to each other. And it's actually, it visually presents pretty well, um, which I'll show you in a second. And, um, there's a lot of different ways to, to work with this data. You can do it manually. You can hand jam it on the, the Linux CLI. Uh, you can take it into a, a, a log analysis engine. You can visualize um, using scatter and, and bubble charts. And I'll show you a couple examples of those in a minute. And, uh, and then there's the statistical methods. And you know, I'm not a data scientist. I don't pretend to be. Um, but I feel that there's, there's some real application for uh, statistical modeling with a data set like this. But what's really nice is that you can compare, for a given IP address, you can compare these observations. And, and what you end up with is kind of uh, behavior over time and, and rendered in a visual way. And you can also compare it to observations for one IP to observations for another IP and see how they, they differ and how they're, they're similar. Um, and there's other dimensions too. You know. Uh, not all network hosts are created equal. You know, we have workstations, we have servers, and then we have all the various functional roles that, that servers play, domain controllers, web servers, database servers, DNS servers, recursive resolvers, and so on and so on. Um, so there's, you know, using some labeling techniques, you can, you know, roll in some asset information that, that help describe these IP addresses and what they do, what their purpose is, their operating system, for example and then you know, start to compare these observations across those dimensions as well. And it's, it's actually a pretty, pretty cool and useful technique.
So um, this is where I was going to jump over to uh, my lab and show you a live demo of, of how cool this was uh, in an interactive way. Um, I was not affected by the, the power outage in, in California. It was a much more localized power outage that occurred when I was flying out here. Um, so currently my lab is unavailable. Unfortunately, uh, we're kind of stuck with a couple of, of poopy screenshots right now. So let's run through that. Um, the first example is uh, kind of what um, HTTP denial of service looks like using just two of those observables. On the y-axis, we have the number of uh, get, um, get requests received. And on the, on the x-axis there, we have the number of, of post requests received. And these are all observations for a single IP address, right? Now, uh, under normal circumstances, you probably have a, a better distribution of, of data points here. This is a lab environment, and, and uh, simulated traffic, let's call it. So it's, uh, it's meant to illustrate the point. Um, kind of what, what you're looking for and, and what I envision as kind of a baseline in this context is this, this cluster of data points at the lower left quadrant of this, this chart. And then obviously some, some abnormalities jump out to the, to the top and to the right there on the X and Y axis. Um, this is a denial of service attack and it leveraged both the get and post uh, methods, and, and quite, quite obviously, there was something weird going on here. Another example is uh, FTP brute force. Instead of just uh, plotting data points for a single IP address, these are data points for two IP addresses, um, one FTP client, FTP server. Um, on the x-axis, we have FTP uh, client um, failed to uh, authenticate to a server. So these are uh, clients that received a failed, you know, authentication failure response from a server. And on the y-axis, we have, uh, you know, the server received an authentication request from a client, and that failed, so it responded with a failure message. And you can see this is kind of shows what FTP brute force looks like from two different standpoints. On the on the x-axis, way out, way far out to the right, we see the the client that's received a high number of uh, failure, uh, authentication failure responses from the server. And on the y-axis, um, way up around the uh, 1,000 range, um, the FTP server that has responded with a high number of authentication failures. So again, normal activity would, would expect to be kind of in the lower left quadrant of this chart, and abnormalities tend to pop out to the right and up to the, to the top. Last example, a simple example, port scanning. Uh, I like bubble charts because they, they actually, instead of two dimensions, they give you a third dimension to, to uh, render a, a quantitative measure. And in this case, I think it's a pretty good application. And, and my son loved bubbles, so I thought it was a good fit. Um, on the y-axis, we have an, an internal host count, so the number of internal hosts this IP address connected to on the x-axis, we have the internal port count, and that's the number of unique ports a host connected to. And the bubble size in this, in this chart represents the number of rejected communications. And as you can see, normal activity kind of, again, kind of clusters over towards the bottom left of, the, of this chart. Um, and then we have some obvious abnormalities going on here with these, these large bubbles floating off to the right. Uh, you know, the, the internal port count is in the 1,000 range, and the bubbles are actually growing in size. You know, the number of rejected uh, connections when you're performing a port scan goes up, spikes. So this is, uh, this is again, just a kind of a visual uh, representation of, of how these data points can be uh, analyzed. So um, this is not without some limitations, right? This, this approach. Um, is, is pretty good in practice and in testing, um, but a lot more uh, vetting and testing really needs to be done, and I'll admit that. Um, one of the things that you, you may have already considered is transient host and DHCP. IP addresses change hands um, in most environments, in, in particular workstations or VPN, VDI, elastic cloud environments, things like that. IP addresses move around, so 
may be tracking behavior um, associated with a given IP address isn't a great fit under those circumstances. It, it certainly works well when you have static IP assignments, but in some, in some circumstances, it doesn't work so well. And then there's this, this scale issue, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, large networks, lots of IP addresses, lots of busy IP addresses. Um, you know, the, I think the, the concern there is a lot more about resource load on the cluster and stability and, and performance and, and all the implications that that might have. Um, so those are certainly considerations to make um, when, when kind of putting this kind of approach in play. And again, kind of addressing this, this scalability concern of, of this technique, not only this module, but this technique in general. I mean, it, it does, you don't have to use uh, net-based to, to get this done. Um, uh, these techniques you could, you could implement in, in Splunk or in, in Elasticsearch and Kibana or on the CLI. Um, there's just uh, different methods to, to kind of solve the same problem. I've got a couple plots here um, that just kind of graph, you know, help visualize um, some of the, the stats uh, that are included in the, the net-based stats log stream I mentioned. Uh, the first one is um, IP addresses distributed by over the proxies over time. Um, you know, this was a, a really small test environment that I grabbed these, these uh, charts from. Um, total number of, of IP addresses was 15, so really, really minimal. Again, not, not really battle tested in that way. Um, but you can see that the, the, the data partitioning API does, does its job, it works. You know, a, the even number, what's an odd number of IP addresses in the environment, but relatively even number of IP addresses or keys distributed across these proxies. So um, that, that, that uh, both of these charts hover around seven over time, so um, pretty consistent. And also uh, the, the observations table size, which I think is also very interesting to, to understand how, how that table grows and shrinks over time. And if it continues to grow and doesn't shrink back down, obviously that's a problem. That's, that's something that, that we can't live with. Um, but as you can see, uh, there's been typically staying around 100K, again, very small network, relatively busy, um, but nothing substantial going on here. And then occasionally we see these spikes up over 200K um, for a given proxy. And th th those are circumstances like denial of service or port scanning, where the number of unique instances of a thing, an, an observable, um, you know, spike up. Thankfully, they come back down. That's what I was hoping and expecting to see. Um, so the expiration timer and, and that, that memory is, is being reclaimed, so that's good. So um, now I've run through all that. Um, we're gonna talk a couple minutes about uh, what, where I wanna take this, uh, kind of what's next. Um, as I mentioned, it's very much a work in progress. Um, it's running on, on Zeek 2.6 right now. Um, I know 3.0 came out a couple of weeks ago, and I figured since it's not released yet, it's not available yet, it's a good time to make it 3.0 compliant. So my, my first and, and, and top priority is to do that. You know, make it 3.0 compliant and get it released as a Zeek package. I wanna add some new observable types. Um, mean, max, and min are some examples uh, to take advantage, better advantage of, of some of the, the quali quantitative data that I mentioned before, the byte and packet counters and, and the like. Um, there's so much more to do with, with implementing traffic analysis techniques. Again, kind of backing backing down from the, the techniques that are described in the attack model. Um, there's so much more to do, protocol specific things. Um, we heard yesterday about all the, the RPC uh, methods in use and all the SMB commands and subcommands. There's a lots of RDP activity, you know, that's, that's being used frequently these days for internal propagation. You know, you, you think about the number of times a, a workstation initiates an RDP session to another workstation that's usually pretty minimal. Um, so tracking these kinds of stats um, can, can really help identify normal and, and thus ab abnormal activity. And, and the analytics, I, I showed a couple of uh, scatter and bubble charts, um, just some, some simple examples. There's a lot more to be done there. Uh, that stuff was all being done at Splunk. And you know, my, my work will probably continue with the 
you know, using the dev license, which is free, which is nice. Um, and I'll, I, eventually I hope to uh, release a, a Splunk app, a free Splunk app that, that is meant to work with this data set and, and help those that are interested kind of get more familiar. Um, so in conclusion, I, I just hopefully I left you with the, the point that um, network baselines are, are a real thing and that they're actually something that uh, you can implement and, and Zeek I think is a, a great tool for doing so. And it does have real application in network defense and cybersecurity. Uh, there's lots of different ways to categorize uh, network traffic and network host behavior. Um, I just talked about some simple examples. Of course, this, this could go on and on and on. There's, there's tons of ways to, to, to kind of different lenses to take uh, when you're reviewing this traffic data. And Zeek is a great tool. I think we're all here for, for that reason. And it's, uh, this is one of many ways you can use it. Um, I hope this, this garners a little bit of interest in this, this technique and this approach. And again, you know, look for the package when it finally uh, gets published and uh, hopefully you, you kick the tires on it and let me know what you think. That concludes my talk. <laughs>